Good morning everybody, it's Alara. Welcome to my channel about cross-stitching. 99% about cross-stitching. Um, today's video is a little bit different, um, so thank you for joining me if you stop by out of curiosity. Um, I am going to... I, I've had some, some questions about the friction pens that I use for gritting. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to not only explain how I use those, but to show you how I prep uh, a project, uh, a bigger project. Um, usually full coverage. I actually have like a four and a half year, <laughs> it's gonna, it's like four in the morning guys. Um, but today is June 5th. So technically today is the day I start Crystal Garden uh, with Jessica Murray from Peace Love Stitch. Pe I, I'm sorry, I always mess up your channel name. Um, I'll put it here. Live, laugh, love. Live, laugh, love, Stitcher. That's it, right? Is that what I put on the screen? Um, so we're starting this today. I just now am prepping my fabric because I didn't want to stop stitching other stuff. But now I need to start stitching this one. So here we are. Um, so yeah, I'm going to jump different views for you a little bit. Um, show you how I calculate for this type of project. Um, you know, some people have asked about margins and things like that. That's really kind of personal preference. I have found that since I've started using Q snaps, that I really need to have a three inch margin in order to make the edges work well for the Q snap. So even though my my little frugal heart goes, you're wasting fabric. It's not really a waste. It's just part of the cost of a project. So let's get into it. I will start with showing you, I'm gonna pull up my calculator and a screen recorder and kind of talk through a little bit about how I calculate. So I will also put some timestamps for the steps in the description. This video is definitely going to not go up immediately. So date wise probably really won't matter because it'll be a few days before I get done editing this thing. Um, but I'll put timestamps so if you know if you don't have to worry about chopping down a really big piece of fabric, maybe you're not really interested in how you would calculate something like that, um, you know, or you don't care about gritting because you never grid, or you have your own preference on gritting. I'll, I'll put those in case you want to skip around on the video. So, all right, guys. So let me get set up, and I'll be right back. Okay, so this is the pattern that we're starting. This is obviously Crystal Garden by Heaven Earth Designs, artwork by Rose Kahn. Um, so here I'm just going to go by, I use 28 count fabric, so I can't really use the measurements here on uh, that's, the, that's been provided. So I have to take the 500 by 634 and actually calculate what we need to do. So, oops, sorry, I'm drive is weird trying to pull up your other screens so all right so basically to calculate um, your working size of a pattern you take the stitch count divide it by your fabric count and then that gives you your working measurements um, so 17 point really 17.85 um, I always just round up to the nearest um, I may round down depending, but basically 18 inches. Now you do need to add your margin. Um, since again, I use the three inch margin for my Q snap, I have to add three inches per side. So that's going to be six inches. And there's my, uh, fabric usage. So 24 inches is what I'm going to go by. And then I always forget my second measurement, which was 634. So 634 divided by the 28 count gives me my working size plus six inches gives me 28. Now I always have to go back into history because I can't hold numbers in my head very well. So I'm going to need this 23 by we'll say 29. So 23 inches by 29 inches. And that's how I figure out how big of a piece of fabric I need for, um, for a project. This method works for literally any size count. You take the stitch number uh, per side, divide it by the count of your fabric uh, plus your margin, and that gives you your size. Um, and as long as you don't, you know, input a number incorrectly, that's going to be accurate every time. 
Okay, take two, because now I have all my tools. Before, I didn't have a pen, I didn't have my tape measure, and I didn't have my scissors. So, here we go. I'll also try not to rock the boat, because I've hit the camera a couple times already. All right, so um, as you can see, I have a massive piece of 28 count fabric. Um, this is listed as Ada on the site that I buy from. I do get this off of AliExpress since it's not a brand thing with fabric. To me, I don't have to worry about that. So I will link the store in the description box below if you're interested. Um, it is, a, for me, the most cost-effective, um, economical way to get the fabric that I use for my full coverage. And I have already gone through a fabric piece about four and a half yards big already. So, uh, and I will probably go through this and need more for my plans next year. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So, um, if you do have, um, a big piece of fabric that you're working with, um, the, the wrinkles are still there. I don't try to iron. I've tried to iron it out before it not worth it. So, um, what you'll want to do is if you do get a piece of fabric that has been cut at a factory like this and they don't really follow a particular straight edge of the fabric, you're going to want to take a look at the edges and see, sorry, I'm bumping the camera already, see how it's kind of, you can see where they've not followed a particular um, line across here. So it actually grows the farther to one side you get. So you're going to want to kind of orient yourself to your fabric and see if you need to kind of chop off any extra that you're going to have. So I know this is going to be my short side as far as needing to cut this off in order to make it level. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll speed it up from here. With the magic of editing, I'm going to go ahead and even out my fabric piece so that I can measure and go from there. Okay, hopefully that was for the most part in frame. Let me scoot this back just a little bit. Okay, so this fabric is about a 59 inch width fabric. Now I have 24 by 29. Obviously I have plenty of space across here. I tend to try and go my narrow width this way, my wide width this way. Um, that way I try to kind of maximize what I have left of a big piece that way. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, now, I don't know if this is true of all cross stitch fabric that still has the selvage edge. Um, you can't just measure square and cut in my experience with this particular fabric. I can't speak for other uh, large pieces of um, fabric because honestly this is the only one that I've used so far. Um, but I don't know if the edge kind of warps it a little bit. Um, I have had to sort of restretch fabric once I've cut it because it's a little bit off kilter. So let me go ahead and our measurements again were 24 by 29 so i'll go ahead and measure that out now what i'm using to mark is just um this pilot friction pen you can really use any fine point pen or or marker you don't this isn't it's going to be the very edge of your fabric it's going to get basically cut off but i do like to mark and with this particular ada once you Find your, I'll show you what, I'll show you when I start gritting. So hold that thought. I'll, I'll show you how I do the marking and keep it straight. Okay, here we go. So I'm just gonna mark my 29 inch mark here. 
And then I am going to go ahead and mark my 24 inch edge here. But what I'm not going to do is draw a, two lines to make them meet at the corner, um, kind of. I'm not going to use the tape measure, I should say, to do that. I may have to go get another pen to that one. I think this one's getting a little low on ink. So. Um, I'll probably speed this part up simply because the noise from these pens on this fabric could probably, is probably a little grating to some people's ears. So here we go. <laughs> drawn and that part does not have to be absolutely perfect because the scissors are going to arc basically basically all I did was make a guide for my scissors um, it's a little easier to follow the row if I've already drawn on it and again this just kind of makes it so that I know I have I'm not accidentally cutting my fabric wonky and cutting rows off and inches off that I need Um, but with Ada fabric especially, I've not honestly had to cut down any of my um, fancier fabrics, my linens or anything yet. So I don't know if this is just as easy on those fabrics, but I mean, it basically kind of just slides along that row. I'm not putting much effort in to cut that at all. Okay, so there's my piece of fabric. Um, I'm going to put this waste fabric away and then I'll come back at a different angle and we'll start. Um, I'll show you a little bit better how the friction pens work on fabric. Okay, so I've switched pen colors. It's still the friction pen, but I want to be able to see it a little bit better than I can um, the red. So, again, this sound is not the best. But I get used to it. All right, so Crystal Garden. Now, for margins, I literally just take my ruler, um, and you can do any number of ways to measure this in, but I have my three-inch margin, so in three, down three, and then I just find my approximate rows. Again, this doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. And, okay, here's what I love about the friction pen. Can you see this? Let me get you a little closer. Okay, that is going to confuse me. It literally erases. Now, again, I don't know how well this does on other fabrics yet. Um, I tend not to grid any kind of fancier projects um, as far as if it's not full coverage. Um, I just I just don't. They don't tend to be as confetti heavy so far that I've worked on. So I don't necessarily have to stress too much about um, gridding like I will on full coverage. So that's my three inch margin. Okay, now, to actually grid, it's pretty fast. Let me back you out again the way I do it. Um, again, if the sound is bothering you, please, um, you know, mute or, or whatever, turn it down um, while I'm doing this. But I want to show you, now, there, you can see there's kind of a shadow. I actually folded it over, so I hopefully don't bump the camera. I'm not used to filming in this orientation, so it's a little, it's a little awkward. Actually, let me <laughs> because what I need to do is I need to have it flush to the the table underneath in order to show you how I do this fairly quickly. Um, so with these pens and this fabric, I really just get my the point of my pen really in there and push and drag. Again, I know this is a terrible sound, guys. But I don't have to worry. Yes, I will still skip off of the row every once in a while, but it erases and I can just redraw it. Um, and then I, you know, I always 
pull it towards me as evenly as possible because if I try to do it in an angle or you know away from me I actually had kind of a hard time getting those lines when I was getting ready to cut out the fabric because it's going away from me um, but you just pull it straight to you and I think I'm actually I think I'm actually out of ink on this pen I used it to grid a really large project so I'll be right back I'm gonna grab a different pen okay back to now we're doing green um, that other pen actually gridded just over a super sized fully the other day. So I'm not surprised that it ran out of ink. And it does take some passes sometimes to get the ink flowing or to get the line to where I can really see it. Please don't tell me I'm out of ink on this one too. Oh no, I got plenty of ink on that one. It's not cooperative. Okay, so you get the idea. Now, when I count, I don't use a counting pin. I get really close. I get my face way up in the fabric. It's a little easier to see on um, smaller count fabrics, like 25, 22, 20, those kinds of, of things. Um, but you can still see, I count by twos. And I go, can I go closer to you? Nope, two, wrong way. Let me get you in a little bit closer. Going for a ride, hold still guys. Okay, so I get in, I don't count, I don't use the row right next to the line just because it's, it is kind of buried a little bit. And, and trust me, once I start stitching, I can, the thickness of the line doesn't bother me. So I go to this square, because this is my two right here. So there's my first one, there's my second one. I gotta actually look under the camera because I can't even see. And that thread orientation is, is going this way, okay? So I just am going to count by twos using that thread as a guide. I don't really look at the squares, I look at the thread on top. So two, four, six, eight, ten, and this is really hard through the viewfinder, guys. I'm telling you what. And I just do that all the way across. When my eyeballs get crossing, I'm trying to do this on such tiny fabric, I'll start, I'll start actually gritting through. So I'm gonna back you up a little bit a whole lot. Um, I'm actually going to pull the camera back a little bit and do a little bit of a time lapse um, while I get these marked out. So hold on again guys. Try not to make you too seasick. All right and I'm going to try and keep my head out of the shot so wish me luck. Okay, so there is the width of my pattern. So now all I will do is repeat that on the other side. Um, I will just, sorry, my cord dropped in the way. I'm charging my phone while I record <laughs> so that we don't die. All right, so again, I just pull my line down and I know I have three inches of margin. I just kind of pull it down to approximately there. All right, and now this, this time, I don't even know, I'm sorry, back and forth, back and forth. I was gonna try and show you, but I realize these squares are so tiny so again, I'm going to start not right next to the line, but two over. And when you go to the, the opposite end or your, you know, your perpendicular, instead of this way, my threads are oriented this way. So I will be counting the top threads going vertically oriented this way. Yes. All right. Okay guys, editing Lara here. So as I was reviewing the footage from last night's video, 
I realized that it was probably a little bit confusing. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Ada and how the, the warp and weft threads are opposite of each other. Um, I grabbed the biggest count fabric that I have, which is an 11 count, and I'm obviously I'm zoomed way in, but you can tell the way Ada is woven and, and pretty much any even weave, you've got every other square, the threads go perpendicular to each other. So this square has a top set of thread that is horizontal. The next one, the top set of thread is vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical, and so on. And then the next row over will be opposite of that. You can kind of see it's a basically a basket weave pattern. Um, the 28 count fabric does that as well. It's just not as obvious and it's more of a true even weave that's been very heavily starched um, from what I can tell because it's, it's um, two threads per row. So this thread, you can see, you know, you've got your top thread, top thread, top thread. The way the 11 count is, there's actually two layers of, there's a, a top thread here, and then there's the threads that go this way, and then there's like a, a bottom vertical row as well. And they're kind of interwoven a little bit. It's, it's hard to explain, but the 28 count that I have is just two threads interwoven. So you've got two that go over and then they go under and then they go over and then they go under and then two this way. You don't have the, the interlaced um, threads like you, like they are kind of here. It's, if you really look at a piece of Ada, you'll see what I mean. Um, so, so anyways, what I'm saying when I'm talking about, I look at the threads that are on top versus what's on bottom is I'm, I'm looking, I'm following this set of threads that, that follow on top. So here, I'm not close enough to even mark. So here, I'm looking through the viewfinder and it's disorienting. So here it goes this way. Here it goes this way. Here it goes this way. And that's my visual that I'm looking at when I'm gritting. I just follow that top set of threads. So, you know, it would be two, this, hang on. So this would start my two, four, six, eight. 10 and then I mark for that square. And then so on. So two, four, six, eight, ten. I would mark again. So those are the threads that I'm talking about when I'm counting by twos and following that particular thread. I'm counting the top thread of that particular square. And then if I have to follow, you know, when it's turned the other way, you know, I would be following this orientation rather than, so it's horizontal now instead of vertical, but it's the same premise. So two, four, six, eight, ten, mark, two, four, six, eight, ten, mark. Hopefully that helps clarify um, what I'm talking about when I'm saying I'm looking at my threads. It's whatever um, whatever thread is dominant on top in this particular starting square on my two. It's if my threads are oriented horizontally going this direction, that's what I focus on is that those top these top threads. And then if it's oriented this way, it's the threads that are going vertically by twos. For me, it's a little bit harder to count them this way because I actually have to break my vision per two. Whereas if it's the 
top threads going along the row, it's a little easier visually for me to follow that way. So if you have any further questions or this is just confusing, ignore it all and go about your merry day. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, now, if you do use this method to grid and count your squares, make sure that you're on the same row the whole way down. Because if you start using this row on accident or, you know, you want to make sure that your line has not jumped any of these rows on your way down. Because if you start using um, a row that's either not oriented properly to this line or your line has skipped and now you're, you're still on two but your line is over one, um, your threads won't be oriented in the right direction anymore for what, for what you're counting. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, eyes starting to cross, so here we go. Okay, so you guys get the gist of that, obviously, by now. Um, I'm probably only going to grid down to here tonight, um, simply because I've, I've been gridding fabric, I feel like, for the last three days. So, um... And then, okay, again, I'm just going to dig my pen into the spot where my line is and pull. Um, if you push too hard, it does impede the, the ball um, at the end of the pen to be able to move smoothly. Too light though and you will start skipping rows like your pen will jump off off that line okay oh, okay now take it back in Oop, wrong way now, if you can see, it's, it's to me, after doing so many of these grids, um, I can tell immediately when I've jumped off um, my row. Every once in a while, I'll start the row incorrectly, and visually, I can see the difference between those, you know, between my two rows. So, again, it comes with, this isn't an actual eraser, it's just like a rubber-tipped whatever it literally just creates the friction heat that erases that line um again i don't know if it has to do with how stiff this fabric is as to why it it's able to generate the heat well enough without warping the fabric um, that's something that you would have to kind of play around with so let me show you how i how easy it is to get rid of these lines once you've stitched your fabric um, so let me grab my other piece and move again to my ironing spot and I'll be right back. Okay, so this is the only piece that I have done enough that I can comfortably start erasing, um, within the fabric up here. But as you can see, um, the, the red marks definitely show through all that white. So I've got my little mini iron here and I've got it just on the medium heat setting. I can't, I can't get it super flat on here because it's still in the um, frame, as you can see. But so I'm just using the tip of the iron. But as you can see, they come right out. Ta-da! So, and this is not a column line. That's actually a shadow in the table. So, but so yeah. So once once your piece is done, you just iron out the marks, and there you have it. Now there is a drawback to these pens. Um, let me grab a piece of fabric and show you what I mean. 
Okay, so not that you're going to try and mark black fabric, but I wanted to show you what happens on a darker piece or a colored piece of fabric with these pens. Um, they don't have white, so you wouldn't really be able to mark a black fabric anyways. Um, but I'm just going to color a bit on the fabric. And, I mean, you can't even really see where I've marked that. But let that dry. Now, if you were even on like a lighter color fabric to mark... It will leave sort of a, of course, there's fuzz for my animals, um, but it does leave this whitish residue because the ink doesn't really go away. It just sort of becomes clear or, or basically white. Now, whether or not this would come out in a wash, I don't know. I haven't tried. Um, but again, I would definitely exercise some caution. Let me grab the, I have a black pen here. I would definitely exercise caution if you are trying to mark a piece of color fabric with like a black pen, just like that. Black is even worse. It definitely, you know, makes that, that white residue show up pretty harsh. So... I would definitely only recommend using this, um, these friction pens on white Ada fabric, maybe cream, but I probably, I personally probably wouldn't even risk having that sort of odd shadow on a cream fabric. So that is the one drawback to these pens. Um, but for full coverage pieces where, you know, you're, you're, that's going to be a ton of, ton of grid. Um, it's worth it to me to use it on those simply because I'm not going to use thread to grid a full coverage piece. So I really hope you found, um, this part as far as how I prep my fabric and how I use these friction pens to, to grid. Um, if you have any questions that I have, um, forgotten about, um, I'll link, I got these off of Amazon. I'll put a link below. It's not an affiliate link or anything. I, I don't have time or the patience to figure out how to do that on Amazon. Um, but I'll, I'll link it below. I'll link the store. I think that's the only thing I've really used so far, right? Right. Um, and then I'll go ahead and clip on at the end of this how I make my floss drops. Um, and I also got the dies from... Amazon as well. So stick around if you want to see that as well. Okay, so in order to make my floss drops, um, these are my supplies. Basic hole punch, a three quarter inch circle punch, um, a one and a half by two gift tag punch, three, three inch binder, hang on, Two and a half, two and a half inch um, binder ring, old deck of cards, and label stickers. Um, one of my sons actually has um, some anxiety issues that he uses uh, cards. He uses those are as like a fidget. He shuffles them until they wear down, and he found a whole bunch of cards. These are these are actually brand new. Um, but he found a whole bunch of these and gives me the decks as he wears them out. This one, he was just like, here, have a deck. Um, so I actually use this upside down so I can see where it's oriented. Now I can get two gift tag punches out per card. And I am OCD enough that I want the, the picture oriented. So I have that part left of the card. Can you see that? Um, that's absolutely not necessary if you don't care, but I do. So, uh, loud punch. And there's my, my tag. So I'll go ahead and punch the other side. I forgot to actually look if you could see what I was doing in that. Oh yeah, that's good. And rinse and repeat as needed for that. Um, for the, the floss actually goes through, um, the larger end 
and I found that putting it all the way to the back of the hole punch and just kind of eyeballing in the middle. Uh, you can see there is a little arrow that, pun that points to the middle there and punches it out pretty perfectly. Uh, and then I use just my regular, and this one's a little bit harder to get like super accurate with, but I just punch, punch that out. Um, and these labels I got off of AliExpress or it came with one of my diamond painting kits. I don't even remember at this point in time. Um, but I just stick it on one side or the other. I try to make it on the side that's a little bit more readable. It's not going to get lost in here right to the number of the floss. Stick it on my binder ring. Ta-da. And then I kit up as I go. So I'll punch out, I think... Crystal Garden has 90, 89 colors, pretty normal, standard for a Hade, um, regular color chart. So I will probably put all 89 tags on here and kit it as I go until it's a little too awkward, and then I'll add another ring and split them up at that point. Um, so that's basically how I prep any given full coverage BAP. Okay, just a little interjection here. I thought I would go ahead and show you how I prep an actual skein. Um, just because, I don't know, I, I've never seen anybody show. Not that I've looked, but um, so a lot of people will be like, oh, you just pull this out. I, this tail and I do not get along. Um, and since I'm cutting up the entire skein, um, when I pull thread for a project, I just pull the entire skein. Unless it's like literally two stitches. So um, I go ahead and just pull both, both of the labels off, kind of find where it splits. And usually that comes apart fairly naturally into its circle. And then I will grab the end, let me back out just a little bit, and keep keep the circle on my hand and just kind of unwind it. Um, and the reason why I do it this way is because I prefer to have my lengths even. I don't like to pull as I go. And yes, I tangle. I still tangle my threads and, and stuff. So it really just depends on how comfortable you are with getting your knots out and getting your thread going again. But basically, it just turned into a simple slip knot. So once you, whoop, comes right out. Um, I do have a more detailed uh, video in one of my stitch and chats about how I deal with knots, because nine times out of ten, a knotted thread is simply a slip stitch, and you just have to figure out the right way to pull it off. Um, I get my two ends to meet. And then I just slide the two between my fingers. Again, I don't when you're when you're un when you're trying to manage an entire skein of floss, this might make give a lot of people anxiety. Um, don't snug your thread like this the entire way. You want to just kind of let it be free. And it's just kind of a gentle so that it doesn't tangle on itself nearly as bad as it could if you if you just choke it it will not so just let it untangle itself because it's not really tangled it just looks like it is um i get my loop and this this marks by pulling it down like that that marks the halfway part point of the skein 
And then again, I just pull it through. I keep my these two fingers in between the, the two separate groups now. And again, don't choke it. Just kind of, I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. Hopefully you can see that on the video. I'm probably not super centered. Again, I don't film this way very often. And again, you just kind of let it be free. And then one more. Um, this is about this is about elbow length. Um, if I were to take it to from my the tips of my fingers all the way out, it hits. There's the bend in my elbow. It's just past that. So that's a very comfortable length for me to work when I'm doing one over one full cross. Um, if I'm doing a two over two piece, I will leave it this length and cut. Um, sorry, I will leave it that length. For a loop start but i don't work two over two very often or two over one very often anymore it's mostly one over one full cross for my full cover just just take the ends of your loops and snip and there's your skein all managed um now un undoing a skein of floss like that i understand a lot of people are gonna be like oh hell no i ain't doing that mm -mm. I get it. It took me a it, it took me a long time and it took me being patient with getting knots out to figure out how to do that quickly. Um but it's the fastest way for me to kit up 90 colors of floss even when I'm not doing it all at once. <laughs> so, I don't know. Hopefully that helped. Hopefully that didn't put you off of doing an entire skein of floss all at once <laughs> and and if the just pulling the tail out of the skein works for you keep keep on keeping on um i just i prefer to do the whole the whole skein at once so all right back to the uh back to the ending thanks guys um so yeah if you guys have any questions like i said i'll if i can find my links that i used for these exact products i'll put them down below um I'm pretty sure you can get label stickers like these at any office supply store. Again, a whole punch, any office supply store has them. I don't know where to get these other than Amazon. So if you have any suggestions down below that might be a little cheaper than Amazon, feel free to, to sh you know, shout them out in the comments. Um, yeah, but like I said, I hope, I hope this video was, was helpful and, and in any aspect for you, or at least was entertaining while I fumble around my video as normal. Um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, and uh, if you like this video, feel free to check out my other videos. Uh, mostly I just do update videos. Um, there's a couple of stitch with me's, but I'm not good at those. So I don't really do them anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, any other questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. And I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your day. Take care, guys.